post-1991, the policies changed. But that mindset, I think, lives on, where we still see the government as the source of, source of economic success. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, that legacy has to eventually go away, and it will go away as more and more industrialists follow Rahul Bajaj's example and speak up. Um, because, uh, you know, if there are a hundred of us who are forthright, then you're there, you're, you're fine. It, you'll no longer make the headlines because, you know, the 101st fellow who speaks, um, it's pretty boring for you to write about it. Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thanks for watching Inquiry. It's unusual to find an Indian industrialist willing to speak in an open and frank way about the state of India's economy and relations between governments and corporates. But my guest on the show today is exactly that kind of refreshing and engaged voice. Noshad Forbes is the co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, India's foremost steam engineering and control instrumentation firm. He's also been the president of CII and a consulting professor at Stanford University, where he got his PhD from. Noshad recently wrote a book called The Struggle and the Promise, Restoring India's Potential. He envisions a much larger role for corporates and a smaller, wiser, and more benign role for governments in the future of India. It'll be interesting to see what's the roadmap that he foresees for this. Thank you very much for joining me on Inquiry, Noshad. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. I know I'm my pleasure. Very much my pleasure. When uh, uh, when when I heard when I heard about when I heard about this, I said, "Well, everything that I heard said this is perfect." <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed reading your book for many reasons, Noshad. You know, it's it's perceptiveness, but most of all, it's forthrightness. You know, I mean, it's very rare to see an industrialist speak out in, as a public intellectual and to, in, in a deep sort of way. So there's a lot to discuss in the book, but I want to start with the premise of the book, you know, which is that you said to restore India to its promise. So in 2021, when you really published the book, uh, why did you feel that India was beginning to slip on its promise? You know, what are the pillars on which we are slipping? Well, there was, uh, you know, as, as I say in the, in the book, there were two Two things: one long, slightly longer term, and one immediate. Uh, that I think led me to add this subtitle, "Restoring India's Potential," to uh, the title of the book. Um, the first, the first was this sense that I had that un between 1991 and 2017 or so, uh, that we'd just been moving in one direction, which was positively uh, in a positive direction. Uh, that India was in better shape each year than it was the previous year. And yes, there were occasional stumbles and reversals and so on. But broadly speaking, you could look at each year and say we were in better shape than the previous year. I felt that things changed in 2017. And in particular, what changed was uh, first uh, a return to protectionism on the economic side and in terms of our trade stance. Uh, second, um, I thought there was a change. The, the, in the clock, the clock is giving. I such fact. No, I was saying it's fantastic. It's almost cinematic, you know. It is. It's I know it is. <laughs> as you describe, why we are slipping. You know? So that who do, who does the who does the bell toll for? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know. So so the you know the uh, uh, and it's twelve o'clock. So you know. So it, it, it took a while. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so. It's so, well, it's the midday hour now. We are again poised, you know, on yes. that midnight hour. Yes, yes that's hour. right. That's right. <laughs> right. So, so the, the, the second was, uh, I felt that there, was, there were several moves in starting late 2017 to, uh, to provide the bureaucracy with greater discretionary powers. And again, we'd been moving, I think, very positively in reducing discretionary powers which is an essential aspect of reform and essential aspect of, uh, I think for that's healthy for us as a country um, because it enables private enterprise, NGOs, private individuals uh, to take things forward as opposed to decide, leave, leading, leaving, leaving decision-making to 
to to to bureau, bureaucrats, um, and I felt that that was a second thing that uh, that was troubling. Um, but the more particular need for restoring India's potential was actually in 2021 itself. And I actually had a complete draft of the book done by March of 2021, it was all set to go to the publisher on time, actually, which uh, surprised me, <laughs> but, and I think would have surprised the publisher even more. <laughs> so, uh, but all set to go. And then the second wave of COVID happened. And I, it was, to me, it was, well, it was devastating, I think, for the country. Um, and it was devastating also, it, seems, it seemed to me, in terms of how we saw ourselves, um, uh, the damage it did to our international reputation, um, the way we were seen as a country uh, overseas, all those graphic pictures and so on. Um, and I mean, the, you know, our only rationale was that, well, other countries also handle the pandemic badly, as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to how it could potentially have been done. And it was really that experience. And so I held on to the manuscript, uh, spoke to the publisher and said, listen, I want to go back and revisit this manuscript. And I did. Um, and I rewrote bits of it dealing with the pandemic. And the title, actually, the subtitle of Restoring India's Potential was actually a direct consequence of um, my, my, my sense that we needed to restore our potential first before we could talk about moving on and fulfilling it. Right. So well, a long well, answer to a simple question, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. No. I was just uh, trying to intervene to say that, yes, you know, you're right, that if you focus your argument on COVID, the natural reaction is, you know, for many people, and certainly those in government are in positions of power to point out how difficult the circumstances were and, you know, other countries did as badly. I thought the more really interesting intervention you made in the book is that you were saying that it was how the government responded to uh, handling something badly. You know, more focus was then put on the, the PR and the perception management rather than a very honest admission of difficulties, failure, right. you know, sharing with public transparency about, exactly. you know, why there were gaps in decision making and how to fix it, you know. So I thought that was a very important point you were making because, yes, emotionally, people do say, every, you know, even America handled it badly and they're the... They handled it extremely badly. I mean, and uh, and again, there's no excuse for how badly they handled it. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a terrible failure of leadership uh, under the previous president um, that really, you know, as it, it's you see it in uh, in the in such a huge death toll yeah. uh, in the country. I mean, it's yeah, a, but it, which again is not to excuse. Uh, not, know, it doesn't, I don't think it excuses anyone else. You know, to say that well they were as bad. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you've explained why restoring, but you also said that you already had the sense from 2017 onwards that we were slipping and those long, you know, so COVID, there's been a lot of discussion. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, you do talk about very interesting long-term things. And in that, you've put the promise of India on several factors, you know, which is it's a young demographic, it's yes. culture, you know, it's open, plural, tolerant culture. Uh, and, you know, it's potential for innovation and, uh, and for leadership, you know. So I want to go through those three things differently. Uh -huh. uh, you focus on government, industry, uh, and, and, and the populace, our culture. And, you know, that third factor is very, very unusual. So I want to start with that. This focus on culture and economy, uh, Nosha, you know, wh why did you zero in on that? And you have very interesting anecdotes. I'd like to look at that. But why did you zero in on culture being very important for economy? So, you know, my, my, my field, my academic field earlier on was uh, innovation in developing countries. Uh, so looking at how you build technical capability in developing countries. Um, and to me, one of the most striking fact, facts that I came across was how both Indians, I talk about this in the book, I mentioned this in the book, that India and South Korea both passed remarkably simple, similar laws around the same time, around 1970, regulating the import of technology um, with incredibly different consequences and incredibly different ways in which those same laws, roughly the same, sometimes even the same wording of clauses, 
ended up actually being implemented very differently. So in South Korea, um, you had in both countries, we had restrictions on technology imports. In South Korea, firms, local firms, South Korean firms and South Korean government use the laws as a way of negotiating and getting a better deal from foreign firms. In India, Indian firms and foreign firms decided that they needed to find a way of getting the agreement approved by the Indian government. And so, in a sense, they were together and the Indian government was on the other side. So you had this difference in perspective and this difference in how the same laws played out with very different consequences. And my conclusion from that was not that South Korea was better than India, but simply that Indian, India as a country, as a culture, we are different to South Korea. We are different to many other places. And if we are different, we start with the culture we have and we need to adapt our policies to the culture, not the, uh, you know, not say, okay, fine, we will formulate policy on the assumption that we will all now behave like South Koreans. Uh, we will behave like Indians in what we do, and we should make policy on that basis. So that's that was my that was my, if you like, big prompt for thinking about the effects that culture has on how policy will work. It determines what will work and how it will work and what's effective and not. It's not that one culture is better than the other. It's just that it determines how things will get implemented. You know, culture is best defined as the way things are done around here. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's a very vague definition, but it's an effective definition. Um, and it applies for firms and firms, firm culture and institutions culture. It applies for the country too. Yeah, but you know, it's it's very interesting you say that because often, uh, you know, amongst uh, the well-heeled, the entrepreneurial, as well as government, uh, you know, you always hear this that, we want to be like China or like Singapore or like Dubai. And as you said, you know, those are very different societies, psychically yeah. also, you know, more compliant or more homogeneous, et cetera, you know. Exactly. Uh, two, two things here. Then when you're describing or when you're engaging with the idea of India's culture, do you spot any particular characteristics? What are the positive ones and what are the negative ones? Well, you know, uh, it, the, the obvious one, which everyone talks about, I'm not the only one by any means, is, is our pluralism, is our diversity. The very fact that we have um, everything on offer. You know, if you, if you like a particular kind of food, we have, we have it. Um, if you like uh, a particular kind of dress, we have it. There is no such thing as Indian dress. There's no such thing as Indian food. There's no such thing even as Indian music. You know, it's, uh, there are, a whole range of different options available that come from a combination of history, uh, inclusion of uh, the latest Western influences in Bollywood, for example. Um, and it all, it all comes together in this really fruitful, productive, vibrant uh, final outcome. So I think that's what makes us really different and special. And it's a very, very positive, powerful thing if we recognize it as a positive, powerful thing. Um, the second is, uh, and this is not unique to India, but it's very distinctive about India, uh, is the real emphasis that uh, parents place on their children and on the future of their children, and their willingness to make great sacrifices uh, in the interest of their children, you know, to, to, to go into debt, uh, to finance their education, to look after them uh, well after they would be looked after in the West. Um, and I think that sense of family, that sense of, uh, uh, of investment in the next generation, again, not unique, some other cultures have that too, uh, but I think we we have it in spades and it runs across in India. It seems to me it runs across communities. It runs across regions. It's common right around the country. And it's a very powerful, beneficial, positive attribute again. So, but, you know, linking this back to the economy, uh, when you were saying that you're, wor you know, worried about India slipping on its own promise, does the current dispensation, does it worry you in terms of, you know, changing or moving the ship in another direction on? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, 
less worried about I, I I'm concerned when I see things like the CAA and so on, you know, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, which I thought was a bad, a bad law. Um, the because I thought it uh, it tended to divide on the basis of community, which is not healthy. Um, so uh, I I feel that uh, I feel that a focus on things that unify are actually are actually much more powerful in bringing diverse groups of people together. So I think anytime we focus on those things, on things like economic growth, which benefits all. Indians uh, on all regions. Uh, every time we focus on relatively few things, you know, economic growth, where that growth will come from, putting people to to work in productive, good quality jobs, um, ensuring that everyone gets the right inputs in terms of education and skills to participate in the modern economy. These are things that run across uh, regions and communities and so on. And I think these are the things that we should focus on. When we focus on things that divide us, I think it weakens us. Um, now, having said all that, you know, I agree with the present dispensation completely in objective. I want India to be great as well, um, just as much as they do. I admire their uh, their interest in uh, in a in a in a in a country that leads, a country that's successful, a country that plays its uh, its due place in uh, in world affairs. I am complete. That is all completely aligned with uh, uh, with what uh, I want to see happen as well. So I admire all that. I just feel that when that that it's it if we go about it by recognizing our diversity and by really building and trying to unify. Uh, around a few, just a few, very few, uh, broader common objectives, uh, we will get further and faster. So, you know, that brings me to the issue of, uh, you know, two things. One is you've ha you have a very interesting anecdote about nationalism and, you know, how different countries interpret mm -hmm. that in economic terms, also the impact it has. But just focusing on this, that you, you said about plurality and you said the one of the big qualities of, say, South Korea or China or Japan is <clears throat> homogeneity, you know, whereas we are extremely heterogeneous. Uh, now there seems to be for both for economic, political, as well as cultural goals of the new dispensation, there's an effort to homogenize, you know? So speaking from an economic point of view, even, you know, do you think that that's a, it's, yeah. it has a good fallout? Is it something one should be chasing? I, uh, first of all, I think anyone who tries to homogenize India is, in my view, doomed to failure. <laughs> so, uh, because, uh, you know, people are trying, I think, to homogenize on one on one vector, the vector of religion. Yeah, um, but but you know the way in which uh, someone practices uh, Hinduism in West Bengal is quite different to UP, is quite different to Punjab. Let alone is quite different to Kerala, is quite different to Tamil Nadu, is quite different to Maharashtra. So, I mean. I think any attempts to homogenize, I'm, you know, I think, I think India will win. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, the diversity that, that is us will win. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I more, more strength to you saying that. Uh, and you also said that in economic terms, you know, it's very important to under understand the culture of a country, which in India's case is, noisy, democratic, heterogeneous, plural, yes. you know, deeply democratic in its roots. Uh, you, you quote uh, Mahatma Gandhi saying that I want the house, the windows yeah. of my house to be open and the winds from everywhere to blow in and yet not blow me off my feet, you know. So that's the self-confidence that yes, you say is exactly. the promise of India. But you said this you know, you make a very interesting point about how this should then shape policy making. You know, for our audience, could you share that? Like, what's what impact should it have on policy making and think economic thinking? So, you know, uh, what what I what I I do argue very often in the book that uh, from a policy perspective, there is much for us to learn from the rest of the world, and to be good learners is very very productive and very very important. Now, what does it take to be a good learner? 
the first thing it takes to be a good loner is is to be humble because if you assume that you have all the answers um that you know you're the you're the one with all the the wisdom and so on then what's there to learn and so you avoid if you like the 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 phrase that many and i use in the book is not, you invo- avoid the not invented here syndrome meaning if it wasn't invented here it couldn't be any good so you avoid that and together with that you combine that with enough confidence so you say that yes i want to learn from the rest of the world i want to learn from best practice wherever it might be but i will not take that best practice as being the best for me full stop i will learn from that best practice and then improve it further uh and i'll improve it further and learn and use learning as a way to actually get further and faster such that eventually i'll be more successful more competitive than the person i've learned from but to start with learn from that person yeah. so you know if it's a firm learn from the firm if it's in education policy learn from another country uh if it's uh, industrial policy learn from another country but then improve it still further and make it better than everyone else's right yeah and you also make that point that you know in a country like india uh, the policy frameworks have to be directional you know rather than micromanaging yes. uh, exactly it should be it should be enabling it should lay out a framework and then you should leave it to private initiative to decide which product to make where to make it uh, how much of it to make um, you know what to price it at all of those should be decisions that are left then to private firms yeah but the question i wanted to ask you there nosha was that you know you you while you were president of cii you said that there was a very frustrated american uh, you know wanting to engage with india who said it's so bewildering to engage with india because it's not uniform uh, you know the government takes a decision it's backtracked states won't comply so it's like a jigsaw you know and so the government has had this headline uh, intention of ease of business for a long time uh, but you know i, I was wondering and you didn't kind of elucidate that enough that you know so china maybe but we don't want to be china societally you know which yeah. is just like a diktat and everybody falls in line but in america itself every state has a different set of laws Absolutely. you know they have a different set of laws on, on society politics economics their economies are different yeah. so why should and why would america presume for india to be uniform and do you think india should be uniform well i don't think india should be uniform and um, i think the american presumption is wrong um and the you know when i i've always said to my friends in america that look you know when you expect india to behave like china uh, that's a mistake expect india to behave not so much like china expect it to behave like america right um and states will have different policies um politicians will make statements that in some cases seem completely outlandish and the comment that i've made to them actually is that look if you take the statement made by every indian politician absolutely seriously you will do nothing in india but i've also added if you take a statement made by every american politician absolutely seriously you'll do nothing in america either so you know you have to you have to distinguish between noise and trends you know what stuff should be discarded as being the noise of being a vibrant democracy and what stuff is actually trends it's the direction that the country is actually serious about and going in in terms of action on the ground and that's how i think you judge america that's how you should also judge india uh, i think this makes us a much more interesting place a much more vibrant place and it makes us a place where the private sector has a much bigger role to play and i talk a lot about that yeah. in the book that my expectations of the private sector are therefore much higher in our kind of a culture and environment than they would be for example in a china yeah i'm going to come to your uh, you know your your thoughts about government and industry and the relationship between them as well i just want to stay a little bit longer on the culture sure. question uh you know you very interestingly again you know musing about india's uh, culture and its psyche you know you this thin line between self confidence and arrogance uh, yes. you know do you think we are beginning to stumble uh, you know have we stumbled in the past 
what, what are we making mistakes on now? And you again have a very interesting anecdote about being part of a CII delegation where you were wooing business from another country. And what was the government briefing on that? Could you use that anecdote to help our audience understand this tightrope between confidence and arrogance? So, you know, the, uh, the briefing, the briefing uh, in that particular case was, look, you know, the country needs us more than we do. Um, you know, so we must carry ourselves accordingly. I didn't see any point in trying to attract investment where we were to somehow convey we didn't need it. <laughs> so, so I approached it differently. And I think it was actually effective in terms of uh, talking because I think, you know, the world actually, you know, it's very different uh, for, for India and China. I mean, when we've gone around and met people in different countries, the message has always been, India is not only welcome, but actively, actively wanted. And one of the reasons we're actively wanted is because we are seen as a benign presence and a benign counterweight to China. Uh, China is seen uh, as a superpower and certainly an economic superpower. Uh, and therefore, a country that you have to deal with, have to trade with, etc. It dominates trade in many, many countries. It's not seen as that benign of a presence. India is seen as a much more benign presence. We are actively sought. And I think we should use that to our maximum advantage. You know, use that, um, that countries want us to succeed, want us to be where they are, want us to be investing, want us to be doing business in their countries. We should use that positive trend to the absolute maximum, but use it in a very humble way. Use it in terms of saying that, listen, India is where it is, where whatever it is, country number 140 in per capita GDP, we have a long way to go before we develop and become as rich as you are. Um, if we're talking to a South Korea or a Singapore or a Japan or a whoever, whichever country uh, where we're trying to attract investment from. And I think that's the, I think that approach is the right approach. It's the, it's, it's an approach that will be more effective and deliver, will deliver the results that we seek. So what's holding us back? You know, when you say that we have all this uh, promise, you know, what's holding us back? I think we, you know, as I, as, I, as I say in the book that we struggle when we get the balance between industry, institutions and policy wrong. You know, we have to get the balance of those three right. So what is the right balance for those three? Uh, for policy, you make policy on the basis of the culture that we have, this diverse, plural culture, and one where you enable rather than deciding yourself. So if you like a minimal state, a limited state, a state that focuses on just a few things that only it can do and therefore must do and must do well, and then for everything else gets out of the way. Second, in terms of institutions, you rely on institutions collectively to set the rules instead of the state again setting the rules. So institutions, whether it's the election commission or it's the Supreme or it's the court system widely, not just Supreme Court, or it's uh, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, or it's uh, indeed norms of behavior, um, which are also part of institutional, the institutional fabric of a country. So uh, educational institutions, you rely on them to be independent to independently argue one with the other and between them come up with what's right. Yeah. And then for industry to play its role, not only in running successful businesses, but to collectively participate in doing what's good for the country. So that's this demand that I have then of industry uh, in industry and NGOs, uh, private individuals uh, getting together to, uh, to, you know, need to need to need to play a bigger role in 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 a country like ours than, for example, you'd expect in a in a Japan or a Sweden, uh, where the state is much more capable and can deliver policy and benefits and so on at the at the at the bottom end of the scale. So there's a there's a greater demand for industry and NGOs to play their part in in our country than there is in many others, and industry has to see it as our collective responsibility uh, to play a role in primary education outcomes, which normally industry around the world will not see it as its role for, uh, to play a role in administering vaccines, to play a role 
uh, in uh, uh, in making for a city be a pleasanter place to live in where traffic flows and so on. These are all things that um, industry can play a significant role uh, for, uh, which you do not need to do in a more in a more in a in a society that's further along in terms of development and where the state has greater capacity. So you know, I'm sorry for constantly promising to come back to this discussion oh, okay. in detail, <laughs> but, but especially on you know the state of industry, the psyche and culture of industry in India. What's caused that? The relationship, the you know almost supplicant, uh, submissive attitude of industry to government. I want to come to all of that, but you know, just sticking with this culture thing. Uh, you know, you you have a very you quote David Lands, and you talk about how yeah. cultures can change as well. You know, and it's not that you have you have an essential culture, but also that culture can change. Uh, I'd love you to share with the audience this very insightful anecdote about Portugal and China's uh, naval <laughs> expeditions. You know, in the yeah. 1700s and 1800s, what does that say, and what is the lessons India can draw from that? So I have you know the two longest quotes in the book are. Uh, what you mentioned, Shoma, you know the uh, uh, the this description in the uh, in the Landis book of um, uh, a Portuguese ex, uh, expedition um, where uh, the explorer was given this detailed list of questions um, as uh, Portugal was going to go and explore. I think it was Madagascar, um, and it was you know that they needed to uh, you know what did they eat, what did they use as 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 money. Um, how much was it worth? What did the society value? It was this long list of uh, of questions that indicated. Who else is flourishing there? What are the big cities? Yeah. What are the big, exactly? You know, it was like it, an anthropological right. like question. Twenty five questions. Yeah, and you know, striking in terms of its curiosity about the world and wanting to learn about the world. And the other example was China, where Ch the Chinese naval expeditions. Uh, of the again 15th century, where uh, it was this amazing fleet, much larger ships. Each individual ship was much larger, I think, three times the size uh, of the typical Portuguese ship. Um, and these very grand, this very grand flotilla um, that went around. And he has this wonderful, I think, phrase that uh, you know the, the 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 Chinese flotilla came to be seen, um, not to learn. You know, it was uh, it was not to see. It, they didn't come to see. They came to be seen. Um, they were they were there to display their might. Now that's a huge change uh, that we see between the Chinese flotillas that went to be seen in the 15th century and the China that we saw under Deng Xiaoping uh, and onwards, where it was you know. How do we get your technology? How do we learn from the rest of the world? How do we build these, this really vibrant, successful economy? How do we build educational institutions that are world-class? All of which was a matter of learning from the rest of the world. So you see this big change in culture for China. And you see the same in Europe. I mean, this curious investigating Europe uh, you know, as Europe became the leading continent uh, economically in the world, um, it started to see itself as being, okay, now the rest of the world can come and learn from us. You know, we don't have to learn from the rest of the world. Um, so cultures do change uh, over time. They change with success. I think China is now going the, the other way too. It's, uh, it's, ge it's getting to the point where they're starting to say, look at how we handle the pandemic. Now the rest of the world must learn from us. Uh, I think that's the first sign, the first signs of a downfall. Yeah. I guess America is suffering a little bit of that where they say, look at how we run our democracy and they don't want to learn from other cultures. And don't, uh, don't, yeah. Well, you know, that after, 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 to... after Donald Trump and the assault on Congress, um, they're saying that less. Yeah. Yeah. But that brings me to my uh, the second part of my question. That, so where India is right now, you know, uh, you've talked a little bit about the aspects of its culture that it needs to hold on to which is the diversity, plurality, dem democracy, most crucially. But what does it need to change uh, as crucially? You know, what would be that turnaround of its flotilla? You know, I, I would not consciously try to change culture. Um, I think culture should evolve. Um, if you try to change culture, you usually get into trouble. I mean, 
<laughs> so so yeah. i would not try Again, to china comes to mind <laughs> yes exactly exactly so i would i would not try to change culture i would simply form formulate our policies on the basis of the culture we have so formulate our culture our policies on the basis of diversity formulate our policies on the basis that look in a very diverse place um if you have very close industry government relations they will be seen with suspicion so what's the solution the solution is let the government set the rules that applies to everyone and let it not pick winners because uh, people will look at the winners that have been picked and even if they been picked on very sound grounds uh, they will say hey there was some collusion there you know and there'll be an accusation uh, and a perception of uh, something having been done that was wrong and i think so that's why we should we need a very different kind of approach uh, to policy making in a much more limited approach and that's the direction we've been moving in since 1991 some stumbling more recently but i think broadly that's the direction that we moved in post 1991 and it's been very very productive uh we've seen economic growth pick up dram- dramatically in the 90 from the 9 mid late 90s onwards um you know all of the 2000s were our most rapidly growing decade um so we've seen results i think flow from that that approach to policy making that was much more that was much more productive so uh, you know one is now let's focus on industry like you said it has to have a very big role in a society which you are envisioning you know where government's role is small and benign and directive principles oriented yeah. uh, and you know entrepreneurship should be the driving force of this country so on that then where's the promise of indian industry and where are its failures you know what depresses you about indian industry right now so i get depressed about indian industry when we keep asking for things from the government so when we ask for protection um you know it's not the government that decides that indian industry needs protection it's industry that keeps asking uh for it and then sometimes you know why is government uh here's what industry says and then does its own thing in the national interest and doesn't protect um a less wise government listens to industry and protects <laughs> right um so the you know we asking for protection asking for incentives uh asking for subsidies you know asking that uh, uh a particular product that we make should come should be sold at a gst rate that is 5% or exempt from gst um that bothers me uh that i feel is not consistent with building uh a a level playing field based vibrant world competitive indian industry uh and i think we should do and argue for all those things that leads to that end outcome of a vibrant world competitive indian industry uh same objective shared by many others but i don't think the way to get there is via protection and incentives so i'll sorry this is my favorite tack i'll come back to it because i'm always trying to That's touch fine. on many important things but so you, you know i'll come back to what you think should be the path uh, yeah. to achieving competitive world class uh, industrial entrepreneurship uh, but the second part of what depresses you you know you made a very very important point uh, about industries submission to government you know it's inability to speak up you know when rajiv bajaj spoke up recently you know it's like it's a headline making event rather than it being a robust dialogue yeah. all the time yeah. so why this psyche you know what makes indian industrialists so meek i think you know when when i've been asked that um my my answer i mean this is a this is a guess so huh? this is a th- this is my theory my theory is that it it's a legacy of decades of license raj that decades of license raj meant that indian industry always needed to go to the government for permission to set up a plant for permission to expand the plant for where you could locate the plant for what you could make all of that stuff so that legacy uh you know the policies have changed since post 1991 the policies changed but that mindset i think lives on where we still see the government as the source of source of economic success uh i think that's a mistake uh that legacy has to eventually go away and it will go away as more and more industrialists follow rahul bajaj's example and speak up um because uh you know if there are 100 of us 
who are forthright, then you're there. You're, you're fine. And you'll no longer make the headlines because, you know, the 101st fellow who speaks, um, it's pretty boring for you to write about it. Um, but, you know, if it's only three people who speak, it's worth writing about. So uh, it's uh, so I think I think it has to become this norm uh, that we are forthright and we are forthright about things that we are concerned with, you know, things relating to economic policy, things relating to uh, what makes us a more competitive economy, things related to how we create talent in the country. These are all things that concern us and we should be speaking about them um, and uh, expecting the right things to be done and debating, uh, listening to each other and not saying that, you know, I have all the answers. Um, Here's a view. I don't make the argument that my book has all the right answers in it. Um, I'm making the argument that these are important questions. These are my answers. Uh, I would love to engage and discuss uh, what you think your answers are. And then let's arrive at a better answer than either of us have today. I saw that you quarreled yourself about free speech and debate and engagement on economic issues, but I was going to make the point that corporates are also citizens of a society, you know, yeah. and equally important that you speak, uh, 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 corporates are free or feel the atmosphere free enough to speak about social, cultural, you know, you, you're making that the interlinkages are so important and certainly industries and corporates in America feel free enough to do that, you know. So that brings me to the question, Nosha. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, if I may, a sec. Yeah, of course. You know, it's, I, I believe very much that um, as an individual citizen, I should be absolutely free to speak and express my views. But when I, free, when I speak and express my views, I shouldn't be standing on the shoulders of my company, right? Because, um, you know, who am I in the company? Even if, I'm, even if I'm the head of the company, who am I to say that these are my, that my views are the views that, are, that express the views of the company? I think that I don't think is right, right? So, so as a citizen, I can speak up. So can every, every individual in the company who are equal citizens and have equal rights to speak up and should be speaking up. So I don't think it's the role of an industrialist to be a social activist. Um, it's the role of any, every citizen who chooses to be to be a social activist. Um, and we should have equal rights like everyone else, but no more rights than right. anyone else. No, that's an important point. Sadly, yeah. uh, you know, the word social activist itself now has been given a negative I connotation. Know. So I, I prefer using just like a very engaged citizen. You know, I mean, our I, country and I constitution think engage, is I only think, as safe as we all are as active citizens. I, I agree with you. I think, I think engaged citizenship uh, is the perfect phrase. And we should all be much more deeply engaged citizens. Yeah. So that was going to bring me to the question, you know, you said that this is a mindset which is inherited from the license Raj, you said over the years, uh, uh, the government and the culture of India and this relationship with the government and industry has been improving and moving away from that. So today, uh, do you think it's just an inherited like uh, inherited mindset is the circumstance for speaking up better? And secondly, you know, when one sees all the use of the ED and the income tax and, you know, there are two versions on that. One, people uh, pro the government see it as a cleanup of bad practices, much overdue accountability of industry. Uh, and uh, there are others who see it as intimidation, you know, so how, how would you interpret it? So, you know, if you compare, first of all, um, to me, the real, the real low point in government industry relations was under Indira Gandhi. Um, and uh, you saw the misuse of agencies then. I think she sort of invented it. <laughs> um, you know, and, it's, uh, and, and, and I think I would see that as the low point that we've moved away from. I don't think we're back there. Um, at least not yet, but you know, we're not back there. Um, and it's important to see what was done and to learn from it and to ensure that we don't go that way again. Um, I agree with you that there are two perspectives. There are, you know, there's a perspective of, um, the, we're just cleaning things up, but I think it's important for that cleaning 
that the perception to be more widespread, that people are saying that, yes, you know, it, we should not only be doing the right thing, we should be seen to be doing the right thing. Um, and by people who generally disagree with us. Um, so, for example, recently there was a uh, there was a very valuable report that was put together by uh, a, a, found, a, a, a group that was funded by the Team Lease Foundation, where they listed the number of commercial offenses that carried criminal charges, and they came up with a list, if I remember correctly, of some sixteen thousand plus. Uh, such commercial offenses, which is crazy, right? I mean, you know, you should be able to, I mean, anyone should, should actually go to prison only after criminality is proven in a court of law, not simply because you've been charged with something. And second, you shouldn't be charged with criminality for a, for a, for a civil, for what should be considered a civil offense, uh, a, a commercial offense. So, that's where I would start. I would start by actually reforming our existing laws um, such that we remove this criminality. And this government, by the way, has gone some way towards doing that. It's actually reduced the scope of criminality in, uh, commercial, in commercial law. We still have a lot further to go. These 16,000 are still on the books. I don't know what the number was before they started on that list. But there's still another 16,000 to work on. And uh, that's what we should all be encouraging and indeed demanding uh, actually happen. So, you know, where is it? I'm, I'm no judge. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say we're better off, we're worse off. I'm troubled anytime, uh, you know, any, any constitutional agency seems to be used for political ends. Um, and uh, I'm encouraged anytime a constitutional institution in our country uh, suddenly rediscovers its spine and stands up and, uh, um, and uh, operates in a manner that is independent and forthright. You know, listening to you, I was just thinking of uh, two recent episodes in American public life, which I found, you know, I, I wish we could import uh, aspects of that. One was the Facebook hearings, you know, where uh, there was a public congressional hearing about what was seen as, you know, misconduct by a corporate and impacting public life. But it's such a transparent process of argument, evidence based. Uh, you know, it's not a criminal uh, court of hearing, but it's a public court of hearing, you know, and that's also the ways in which they, um, you know, they um, confirm their judges. So there's very gripping hearing around Ketanji uh, Jackson Brown, you know, that if indeed, like you said, if it is a process of cleanup, then the principles of that cleanup, the right for uh, someone accused to present their evidence for there to be very informed debate around that, that would create a different culture in the country, you know? I agree. I mean, I think the, I think we can learn many things from the transparency that you see in the U.S. system. Um, the U.S. system likes to uh, likes to wash its dirty laundry in full public view of the world. Um, some of that is a reflection of American narcissism. You know, it, it they 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 believe that uh, the world must constantly look at it. Uh, and see what it's doing, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> um, but some of it is very healthy. Uh, and I think that transparency in public life is a very good thing for us to adopt because it's very consistent with our culture and the way in which we should do things. One thing that we should not adopt is the lobbying system that the American system has. I mean, these political action groups, you know, the, 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 the PAC finance and so on. I mean... Uh, that's not at all transparent. Um, and uh, to me, I think it's very worrying. It, uh, it, uh, it dilutes the quality of American democracy very significantly and it's not something to learn from. Or it's, it's something to learn from in the, in the negative. You know, that's not something we should not have. Yeah, I, was, I totally agree with you on that. But I was just thinking in terms of our judges recently, there's been so much of doubt and cloud around why certain judges are not confirmed or why they are superseded. It leads to a lot of doubt and anxiety in society about 
government's role uh, in eroding the institutions, you know, so if, if they, sh they should be speaking orders of why they're rejecting or why they are uh, taking certain actions, you know, so. You know, what we've seen, you know, if you, if you look at some of the judgments, um, uh, we've seen um, very nice descriptions of why the judgment was made uh, and what is the logic behind it, what's the basis, etc. Um, and 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 I think those judgments are powerful, and they should get a lot more of uh, visibility in our in our public in our public life. Actually, uh, I find it very instructive to uh, to read those, not just know what the judgment was, but why the judgment was made. The same, you know, with the election commission, uh, when there's a dissenting view, and you read that dissenting view, that I think that enhances the transparency and caliber of the constitutional authority that it is. So, you know, we spoke of this government industry relation, but you are advocating for a much larger role for industry in the life of the nation. So there's no inherited block for why, you know, in fact, we have a good history of say what the Tatas and Birlas and et cetera did in the past. So there's no block for greater creative engagement of uh, industry in the life of the nation, you know, even altruistic ones or better business practices, any of what you're advocating, what's holding industry back on that? You know, why is there not more goodwill for industry in India? It's, it's I'd say it's happening. There are examples of it happening. Um, great examples. I mean, if you look at the role that industry played during the pandemic, uh, it played a role where it went well beyond what happened in other countries. In other countries, you know, industry was the beneficiary of a lot of subsidies from the government, uh, you know, employment subsidies in some cases, some cases direct handouts, you know, all kinds of waivers of taxes and duties and so on. Um, in, in India, uh, larger industry, especially, uh, and smaller industry got together very often um, and played a role in vaccination campaigns, free vaccination campaigns, played a role um, in providing food uh, to migrant labor when they were stranded in the early days of uh, the first lockdowns in March, April 2020, um, played a role uh, in, uh, in, in funding hospital facilities being set up and ventilators being uh, uh, being imported and set up in our hospitals. So you saw a lot of that coming together and happening, uh, which is industry going well beyond the role that you would expect of industry. Um, and I think that's exactly right, because industry has that implementation capability and we should do this. We should do more. And the argument I'm making is not only do more, but focus on some things. So one of the things that I think we should focus on is second standard outcomes in primary school because that's a very well-proven well proven approach to enhance education outcomes for the country as a whole. It's part of the new education policy. I think industry in any case works with thousands and thousands of schools as part of its CSR, focusing on one or two of these big platform initiatives could be very powerful and transformative for the country. So those are the things that I'd like to see happen. And then I'd like to see industry also play a role in, you know, in, in itself saying, you know, for example, we have a CI code of conduct, uh, which says comply with all applicable laws. Um, too few CI members have signed that code of conduct. Um, now, it's a good code of conduct. It's a simple code of conduct. Um, it's possible for everyone to actually adhere to that code of conduct. Small firms, large firms should sign up for it. Uh, and not just CI members, it should be industry at large that should really adopt it. Because that, in a way, we need to change perceptions about industry. You know, a few, a few bad eggs um, really color how industry in general is seen. Uh, I don't think it's an accurate view of how industry should be seen. I think the great bulk of industry is actually honest, tries to do a good job, tries to do a good job for its customers and so on. Um, and I think uh, I think the more we can we see more that industry polices itself, um, ensures that we adhere to some minimum standards of legal compliance, uh, and then that we uh, that we also collectively start doing things for the greater good. Uh, the more I think we'll change that perception. 
So Nashad, we're going to run out of time. As I said, your book is very rich and they are, you know, even it's so refreshing to have someone outspoken, engaging uh, with the larger idea of the nation. Uh, so, you know, you've spoken about inclusion as being a very important thing. And what is the method for that inclusion rather than only direct transfers and, uh, you know, cash transfers? Uh, you focused hugely on education, you know, of being the most important health and education being the two yes. big factors. Uh, and, and then there's the whole role of government. So I'm not sure we'll have time to go over all of that. But, the, you know, you've been quite critical about government by announcement, you know, and you don't want to go into the past of what wrong the governments have done. There's always enough jokes about how everything in 2022 is the responsibility of what Nehru did in the 50s, you know, so there's no point. Uh, I am not trying to be partisan, but of course, let's engage with what's going on right now. And when you're, when you're analyzing the government right now, you're critical of government by announcement, you know. Uh, can you explain that and what that criticism is? So, you know, um, I... The, I use actually uh, a book by Vijay Kelkar and Ajay Shah. You know, uh, I, I I think it's a great book. I've uh, I refer to it a lot in 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 my own book um, uh, called "In Service of the Republic." And one of the things that they they say in the book that you know work step by step, uh, work with transparency, um, and keep iterating and improving uh, instead of big bang announcements. Um, because big bang announcements usually then reflect a lack of preparation. Uh, they very often um, are an announcement that's made, and then one is scrambling to figure out now how do we implement the announcement. Um, and sometimes you find you can't implement it too well, so then you just claim success on <laughs> some grounds and uh, move on. Um, so I think it's important to it's important to work in a more in a less exciting way, um, but a more systematic on the ground delivery way. So uh, the, the, there are many examples, um, you know, take for example, the reforms that we need to bring about in our research system, in our education system. Now there, I think we've gone about it exactly as we should, not by announcement, but by new education policy, here's the draft, draft is put up on the website of the ministry, um, available for comments, lots of people commented. Um, you then have a final policy that emerges incorporating many of those comments. Um, that policy now needs to start getting implemented. As it gets implemented, I hope we will be equally transparent as we have been in the formulation of the policy itself, because that's what will make it happen. It will make, you know, it's a huge change that we're talking about both for school and for college education. And it's the what in that policy is, is I think broadly right. We need to see it happen. Um, I worry about how it will get implemented uh, on the ground. And I want to worry less about it. Uh, and I would worry less about it if I can see, you know, things being done saying, this is how we want to implement the second standard outcome policy to encourage states to move in that direction. This is how we're going to uh, implement the policy to have larger universities, just not just separate professional colleges. Um, this is how we're going to bring them together and let people engage with these issues because we will then proceed with the implementation in a much more effective way. That's what I'd really like to see happen more and more. So that's the step-by-step -step versus the big bang announcement. Um, you know, big bang, I, don't, I don't mind, by the way, I don't mind. You know, some people like big bang announcements, uh, catch, captures everyone's attention. I don't mind as long as that then gets supplemented by, uh, I mean, the announcement doesn't do anything for me, but, uh, you know, as long as it's get, get supplemented by the same, then transparent. Now, this is how we'll implement, this is how we'll work on it. By the unglamorous hard work. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's very, it's much less glamorous, much less exciting, but much more useful and productive in the end. So you you pointed out one which is they've done well the the current dispensation has done well on the NEP formation yeah. the formulation uh, what would you think what would you count as one or two where there's been a big bang announcement and either a false assertion or where it's just gone under the carpet well I mean the the, the classic example is the farm laws um, take the farm laws I mean the farm laws were 
were passed, uh, you know, first by, uh, uh, they, well, they were first passed by ordinance. Then later they were passed uh, on a Sunday on a voice vote, uh, you know, not being sent, the bills were not sent to committee. Um, and then look at what happened. You had all of this opposition that arose. And these, those laws, it, in my opinion, those laws were good laws. They were the, they were, they would have moved, they would have done good things for agricultural productivity. They were good things to have happen for the country. Um, but the way in which they were implemented, sort of in a dramatic by announcement way, um, meant that they eventually ended up being withdrawn. Uh, I think the country loses out uh, in, uh, in, in, in certainly in that case. Right. You know, and there are others that you've mentioned, you know, the big banks about uh, 100 smart cities or stand up India and, you know, all of that. So, uh, but, but equally, you've pointed out some of the good things that have happened, which is the bankruptcy law, you know, GST, uh, GST, though, again, you say there's a lot of confusion. Yeah, around there are many, many improvements we need to make, but we shouldn't lose sight of it being progress. It's yeah. relative to what we had before. It's a substantial degree of progress. Yeah. So, and, and like you said, it's iterative. You keep improving, yes. you know, in a noisy democracy that's needed. So I'll finally, as I said, we're going to run out of time. I was very, very interested in your thoughts on inclusion as well, uh, Noshad. You know, you make that a very, very important part of how India can improve. Uh, so two, I have two quick questions there. One is just a few years ago, we were talked of in the same breath as China, uh, you know, and now we are completely dehyphenated from China, thankfully in terms of not being as autocratic as that yet, uh, but also economically, we are no longer hyphenated as, you know, equal cousins. So why? What were the big mistakes made? And this path to inclusion, this government is repeatedly getting, uh, you know, a very strong vote on what is its welfare programs, direct cash transfers. But you say that does not account for inclusion. Can you just give me your thoughts on that? Sure. So, you know, f first of all, in terms of the... Uh, the comparison with China, yes. If you go back to the mid two thousands, um, we were the comparison was very much an India China. Uh, Infinite, yeah. You know that's right. You know that that India would be the next big engine for the world economy uh, over the next decades. I think we still can be right, but we need to make that case again. Um, we today, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, we were one fifth. China size. We're now just about one sixth China size. So um, that's not the right direction. We need to grow faster than China for the next 30 years um, and close the gap over time with where China is. So uh, that more than anything else, that focus on economic growth uh, coming up front and center uh, is what we must do. Uh, it's what will it's what will underpin our standing in the world, our foreign policy, our ability to deal with incursions on our northern borders, everything. Right? Um, it's I think going to come down to our economic success. Uh, so that's what we should focus on. It's in the interest of all Indians um, and anyone who says, you know. Growth is not everything. It's not everything, but without it, you can't do anything. So, you know, growth comes, it seems to me that growth should come up front and center. Yeah. Uh, and God that, is reminding us that we are through. Ah, okay. So then, and then on your second question, very quickly, hmm? your, on your second question on, um, on, on, on inclusion, right? And, and what we need to do for inclusion. So we need to focus on primary education without question. Um, we need to create opportunities uh, for uh, people as widely as we can in terms of good employment opportunities. Transfers, cash transfers, giveaways are necessary support, support programs. They're, they're very important to be a civilized place because you can't have pe people who are starving need to be given food <laughs> without question. So, uh, but that's not a policy of inclusion. That's a policy of social support. It's very healthy. It's necessary to do. A policy of inclusion is a policy that enables people to participate in the modern economy of the society and the, and the growth and the growth that the, that the country will experience. 
Thank you so much, Noshad. I could spend an hour more, uh, you know, detailing out your thoughts and also the people that have shaped your thinking and you as a person. Sadly, we haven't even got to that. Uh, but I, I think what you just said, it's a very important reminder that the most capitalist societies have all invested hugely also in public education. You know, when you're talking about the yes. privatization of things, uh, health and education are two things that the most developed and capitalist societies have maintained public engagement and the government's role in education and absolutely yeah. absolutely both you know you the, the, in the us uh, you know consider this highly uh, private education you, you might see the stanfords and harvards of the world as these great private institutions but the great bulk of american college students go to public institutions and the overwhelming proportion of american school students go to public institutions. So at the end of the day, the quality of American education, um, you know, the Stanford's and Harvard's are at the very, are, are the pinnacle, but it's a very small pinnacle. Uh, the, the quality of the, of the wider system is a reflection of the quality of its public system. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's good to remind ourselves of. Yeah. And ditto for, I did an interview with Sir Malcolm Grant, who was one of the founding chairs of the NHS yes. uh, in Britain. Absolutely. The health, health system and the Scandinavian countries. Free Absolutely. You know, so. I think the NHS has done more to raise the standard of British health uh, than any other institution, probably any other institution in any other country. Um, and it's actually a very efficient system. I mean, Britain spends less on health as a percentage of GDP uh, it spends, as far as I know, it spends less than half as much as a percentage of GDP on health as the U.S. does. Um, so it's a very efficient system for very similar outcomes. Right. So lots of uh, things to take away, Nausha. Thank you for that animated and very transparent, engaged conversation. And I urge everyone to read your book. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Omar. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.